tech is on working and how it is to be uh, entrepreneuring in the biotech fields. Please have a warm uh, welcoming applause for Joachim. All right, well, uh, thank you, Us. Uh, uh, today I'll, I'll cover uh, the, how is to set up companies from a scientist per perspective. I, I'm not a business person. I've been involved in many projects of entrepreneurship from the scientific point of view. And uh, I've been developing most of my career in the Silicon Valley as well as uh, in other places. So I'll, I'll show you all that. I'll, w I'll use my personal experience just to walk through the different challenges of raising money, putting together a team, putting together a project to success. And success can be defined in many ways. But really what matters is, is where you start. And where you start is uh, with uh, you know, an idea, a project, Usually it's never the limiting factor. People tend to think that projects uh, are funded based on, on the value of the project itself. But frankly, most projects that uh, people work on that are in biotech and others are usually great. The, the ideas are, are very interesting. You know, there's a bunch of people who are trying to solve a problem, either to find a new cure for some treat, uh, some disease that has no cure, new diagnostic. We saw in, in this uh, platform, uh, the previous talk was really interesting as well as a few others from the last few days. So actually, uh, it's, there are plenty, plenty of, of different concepts. Now, what people have to realize and often scientists don't realize is actually the amount of resources to develop a, a projects are huge. And that's really the limiting factor. It is how to get these resources, how to convince these people, uh, how to, to get the often large numbers in order to make a viable project and move it forward. Uh, just a, a, a brief summary of what does it cost to, to uh, find a new drug and develop it. The discovery site is usually cheap. Uh, it, it only requires a few million dollars. So uh, this is uh, usually the easiest money to get, to get. As you develop the drug, so as it goes from discovery and you test it in, in whether it's in animal models, uh, with patients and so on, this is when the cost increases and this is where it gets more and more difficult to raise money. And soon we're really uh, talking about amounts that go way beyond what a venture capital would put. So you need a strategy in order to find this first million dollars, uh, the next 20, 40 million dollars, and then the next 100, 200 and more in order to, to take your project to success. So uh, it's in order to do it, uh, it's not only you need the project, you need something that is tradable. Patent license, an idea alone gets you nowhere. Getting a patent is very simple. Getting a license also is simple and it's cheap getting a team that will be able to execute all these projects and getting it to success is way more complicated. And actually, this is where uh, the difference between success and failure usually comes up. The, when you go to present to investors, uh, first you have to keep in mind that the likelihood of getting a specific investment from a venture firm actually is very low. Uh, in my experience and also talking to, to plenty of, of VC firms, usually they fund very low numbers of the projects that are presented. Just to give you an idea, uh, if you go to a VC firm without an introduction, so a proper presentation of, of your team, the uh, odds of getting funded is less than 1%. It's about 0 0.5, 0 0.1%. If you know them, it goes up, but it goes to one, to two to five percent, meaning that the likelihood of getting an investment once you present to a VC firm actually is pretty low. Uh, now, VCs have their own uh, ways of assessing the project. The project itself is quite important, but often it's not the the, the what will trigger the investment. In, in the, VCs invest on a project, but most and important, invest in a team. So you have to go 
with a, already with a team in place, people that, that are committed to the project, they have different sets of expertise, track record matters a lot. You also need an advisory board, so usually these people are professors, people that work in hospitals, people that work in universities, that will support the project and will be able to answer questions from uh, investors. And investors trust them as a way to know uh, that the project actually is sound. It's very easy to get access to these people. It's not that complicated. If the project is good, you can actually, uh, will, you, you'll get a pretty good answer from uh, opinion leaders, from people that are really experts in the field. Usually, uh, including Nobel laureates, if the project is interesting, they'll just go with you because they want to be involved in projects that are actually interesting. The same goes for the team. At the very beginning, you need the commitment to work for free in your project. People will do that as long as the project is interesting. And the combination of a team plus an advisory board is usually enough to convince uh, venture groups in order to invest if the project is aligned within uh, their, their goals. Now, uh, until you ask, you don't know. It's, it's very difficult to know what exactly will align with the venture firm that you are talking to. It varies a lot, they often don't know themselves, so you have to show the projects to the venture firm. And uh, based on what they know, they'll, they'll, they'll invest or, or they will not. Usually, uh, they never say no. They often, uh, well, I think the problem, okay. Uh, they, the different venture firms have different ways of investing. Most of them, what they want to do, what they do is what you see in this graph. They try to identify where the point of inflection of value is. And they want to invest at that point, meaning that if you go with a project that is very early stage, it's very difficult to fund. Because what they want is to get a quick buck on their investment. Now, there are ways of, of managing that. You can go, uh, you can raise governmental money, say grants or other, in order to uh, invest at the very beginning. And then as you go along, you lower the risk and the investment is more attractive. This graph was done by um, a venture firm that actually, that's what they show in order to uh, show w where they invest. In this case, they would only invest when, uh, with their assessment, the risk is about 85%, meaning that uh, it's about to go, uh, your, uh, your, your, their investment is about to go. Oh, it's a screen, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll keep tapping. In that case, uh, is roughly when, when their assessment is, is about 85%. And that's when you can get the money. Now, how do you know where you are in your project when you do this kind of, of, of analysis? Well, that's actually uh, key in order to put together the project. So, uh, what, you rec what you need is an asset that is advanced enough and uh, that you have identified these inflection points in value as well as the risk associated to, to the project. <clears throat> you can do that with discoveries, relatively simple. It's easier for development, say you pick up a, a, an asset that has already been discovered but put on hold by someone else, then you pick it up and you develop it. Then the risk is way lower. But uh, when you do go and see and show the projects to, uh, to, the, to the venture capital, you have to have already the team in place, the business plan in place, and ready to execute. Now, I'll walk through my experience to give you a few examples how this was done. Um, the, I, I've been involved in about, I don't know, um, about five projects so far to completion meaning we raise money from the very beginning. Uh, all of them usually vary between 20 to about $150 million in different stages. Uh, the f uh, five projects that I'm showing right here, 
The first one was discovery and development. Uh, that was based in Silicon Valley. The project was funded by uh, several blue chip venture capital that they were already bought into the concept of discovering new antibiotics, which was where uh, the project was based in. Uh, in that case, actually, it was relatively simple to raise the money. We uh, started several projects, uh, were able to get some partnerships with also large pharmaceutical companies like I don't know, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Daiichi. We got on board pretty much every, uh, the most relevant at that time, uh, professors that were working on antibiotic resistance and infectious disease in Europe as well as in the United States. And at the end of the day, uh, we went public, uh, discovered a few new compounds that went into different clinical trials. At that point, I left the company and uh, just after going IPO, and I moved into a different one that also was being created from scratch. And that was uh, Versacor-Vicuron. It changed the name to Vicuron later on. Right here, also it was based on discovery and licensing compounds. Uh, raising money was actually harder. The major reason was because at that time, this was when uh, roughly when the dot-com boom was taking place. So most of the money was going to dot-com instead of biotech and uh, that meant that there was no money outside of internet based ventures and right here convincing uh, VCs was more difficult simply because there was no way you could convince them that the return would be higher in biotech than it would be in uh, the internet business the way to go around that was, uh, well, show them uh, really solid project, but also from their side, they were diversifying outside of internet. They didn't want to put all their money over there. We had a, a couple of partnerships with also large pharmaceutical companies and uh, discover new antibiotics, move uh, one uh, to approval and another one almost to approval. Eventually, after going public uh, and a couple of years afterwards, uh, Pfizer bought the company for, about, um, I think, $1.9 billion. And meanwhile, I uh, just moved on, went to a different venture. We put together another company called Peninsula, where we did license a compound from a pharmaceutical company, develop it, and the company was bought by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and in order to fund this effort, we, that was relatively easy. At that time, uh, VCs had realized there was value in biotech and we, uh, it was relatively simple to raise about 20 to $30 million that required developing the compound. And then I moved to the next round of, of companies. One is Anthera that we went public about two years ago and I left the company well, also about a, a year ago approximately. And another one, Tetraface, which is still private. And uh, it's based on the discovery and development of novel antibiotics. Now, the common thread with all these efforts is, is again, is work with a team of people that actually can deliver. Based in Silicon Valley, it's relatively simple to run into these people. There's pretty much everyone has their day job and their extra time, they start working on these side projects that eventually will become a new company. And that's the understanding that pretty much every single uh, scientist or engineer working in the Silicon Valley has, even with their current company. And actually, uh, all these startups and uh, new companies were done with the acquiescence of the companies that we were working at, the uh, at that time. So really nothing was done in complete secrecy. We were very careful to separate what was the day job versus the kind of, uh, of new projects that you were preparing uh, later on or, uh, in the evenings or during the weekends. And when the time came, so when the project was ready to raise money, this is when we would jump ship. So you would stop working for your company and you raise money with, uh, sorry. Um, 
and you raise money uh, for the new venture. <clears throat> uh, right now, I'm now in my next wave of, uh, of, of companies. Uh, if, uh, we, we, I'm starting two major new projects with uh, a different group of team. One is based half in Barcelona, half in Silicon Valley. So it's a, it's a project that is based on a new technology that comes from Barcelona. And uh, we just put together the team. We have the advisory board ready and we'll start raising money th the next uh, few months. The other project is based on getting a compound from a large pharmaceutical company, which I already have the team. We, I'm engaged in licensing talks with uh, Big Pharma, and hopefully I'll get the compound and be able to, to raise money around that. Uh, both projects required uh, completely different approaches. The one based in Barcelona, here the major hurdle is actually uh, working with people that they, they are very entrepreneur, but they don't have the experience of Silicon Valley. So it's, uh, things are sort of slow. You, it, it takes time just to convince them to move forward, go fast, and uh, be ready to, to raise money. Uh, it, it simply shows a uh, lack of, of experience in that field. The one from getting a license from Big Pharma here, the major hurdle is actually that the large company takes you seriously. It's very difficult to... Well, keep in mind that uh, the large uh, companies, like uh, a very large pharmaceutical company, if you go, a group of two or three people telling them, look, you have this compound that you're not doing anything, it's sitting on your shelf, give it to us, we'll raise money, add value, and uh, take it to the market. Uh, well, they receive these kind of proposals like half a dozen every day. Usually they just ignore them. So the, the key part here is, is being able to convince them that actually your proposal is for real, that you can do it and, actually, and you should be taken seriously by their business development unit as well as by the different uh, departmental units that run the project and, and now is put on hold. So uh, they'll give it to you and you will be able to raise money uh, with this project. The trick is part uh, getting the right introduction at the right level. So making sure that the connection that you're taking up seriously and show a track record as well as a plan to move forward that, that makes sense to them. There are many other, many other hurdles, uh, like for example, uh, you have to take into account that large pharmaceutical companies, they have an inherent cost of doing business. So simply, for example, uh, in order to show you the data they have that allows you to put a project, the cost, just, I'm not talking about profit, but just the cost of putting the documents together, it's about a million dollars, meaning that you have to be able to raise uh, to have an upfront of a million dollars ready to uh, give it to this big pharma, otherwise they will not do anything. Not because they don't want to, it's simply because they have a cost that you have to assume. Uh, you also have to, to convince them that uh, that will be done at a minimum, it will require minimum efforts and resources from their side. So, uh, you, all the work that you do and the access uh, the different uh, members of the team that you need to access will not be a, a, a big cost for the, for the company. All right. Now, it is possible. To I, I don't know what's going on. Well, <laughs> about that. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Now, in order to to do that, you have to be able. You you need a champion within the company. So you have to convince not only the business development side, but also you have to convince a scientist, a clinician within the company, that the project you are moving forward is worth moving forward. 
So the, the conversations that you have uh, with uh, the pharmaceutical company has many different fronts. And you have to be able to understand and put together uh, a little bit of everything. You have to have a strong scientific knowledge of the project so you can discuss with the scientists in equal terms. At the same time, you have to be able to understand what are the financial needs and business development needs of the company. All this is, uh, is doable, requires some uh, investment from the very beginning, but uh, it requires uh, flexibility, patience, and perseverance. Uh, right now, uh, I, my expectations is I'll, I'll know within a couple of months whether they'll give me the green light. And uh, just to give you an idea, it took me probably, I started talking to them about six months ago. And uh, that's the time it gets usually in order to get a deal done, especially if you're starting from scratch. You're dealing with a very large organization. And eventually, I imagine, if everything goes well, we'll get the, the, the deal done. Uh, also, uh, in parallel, I do work with s startups in Europe as well as in, uh, uh, in the United States. Here, simply, I, I sit on their boards, I give them advice, open doors, uh, help them put together the projects. Uh, three of these companies are based here in Europe and right now we have been able to get proposals for funding around uh, about 8 million each one. So the bottom line is even if nowadays that uh, the current environment actually is sort of tough to get financing, my experience is that usually for the right project you'll get financing even uh, during uh, difficult uh, financial times. Right now, I think it's easier to get money in Europe than it is in the United States. And the place where there's more money right now is in Asia. So if you need big bucks, probably the best way to, to get the money is go to Singapore, go to Hong Kong, go to Tokyo, go to Shanghai, where there is, there is actually much more money and is a money that is willing to accept more risk. In Europe, the big advantage that there is versus the United States is that most governments want to create sectors. They're all betting in high tech, in biotech, in other uh, areas th that uh, require, well, that are knowledge driven, and that alone makes uh, capital accessible. It's way easier nowadays to raise, say, about one to two million dollars here in Europe than it is in the United States. Now, when you need 5 to 20, 50 to 100 million dollars, it's way easier in the, United, in the United States than it is in Europe. And that's something to keep in mind when putting up these projects. My advice is, frankly, uh, you can start uh, companies that may be initially based here in Europe or in Silicon Valley or in Asia, frankly, it doesn't matter that much. The team can be global. Every single project I'm involved right now there's people working in California, there's people working in Boston, there's people working in Singapore, there's people working in, in, in Barcelona, uh, Germany and other places. There's no reason why the company should be in one single place. The key is can you communicate, you don't have to travel uh, you know, through the internet, uh, Skype and so on, you can do plenty of things, but it has to be solid uh, projects. And. Uh, people respond to that. So it's not that complicated and venture capital also understand this global aspect of the company. Usually they, are, they prefer to have people that have experience in, uh, with all these other places rather than having a, a team that is based on only one place alone. And the reason being because they perceive uh, having a global reach a way to mitigate risk. So that's actually extremely important. Now. Uh, when it goes down to, to explaining a project to, a, to an investor, uh, what do you do? Well, in biotech, so in new drug discovery and development, the most important part is to identify an, an unmet medical need, meaning that if you can provide an alternative to a patient, whether it's a cure, whether it's a better diagnostic team, so it's something that you actually help people, well, then there is a market there. 
If there's a market, VCs will be responsive to that. But the key, frankly, is you have to solve a problem. You have to solve a medical problem. Uh, that's the most important part. The second one for an investor is uh, they do understand the problem, but they want to know how uh, their money is going to give a, a return. Uh, often investors are not uh, well; they're, they're not as knowledgeable as you are on the specific project. So at the end of the day, you simply have to give a broad idea how you plan to use the how you are going to use the their proceeds. They they have their own consultants and they have their own uh, resources to to evaluate your project. But what is the most difficult part as a scientist is how you're going to link the valuation to progress in the, in the project. And in order to do that, this is the single slide that uh, venture uh, investors want to see, which is how do you link in, uh, valuation with milestones with financing. <coughs> no one uh, wants to see uh, a very broad uh, uh, <coughs> landscape of the investment. What they want to know is what specific milestone are you going to reach, how the valuation is going to change based on that milestone, and what exactly you're going to, to achieve. This is, uh, I always use this graph to show to investors. That's actually the only one they're interested. And you have to be extremely specific, extremely realistic on what you can achieve and what kind of resources you need. No one invests between inflection points of valuation because everyone uh, wants to know what are the results of, uh, of the study or the experiment or the pattern before they invest to the next round. So uh, th that's what they use in order to invest. You have to align your scientific project, the clinical project, with the with very specific milestones and very specific financial needs. And uh, that's what they'll use in order to evaluate uh, the investment. Uh, what people have to understand is actually the the, uh, the different runs of financing, in that case, ABC plus, say, an IPO. The one that matters the most are, are the, the ones at the very beginning, because the later ones, you really, frankly, no one knows what is going to happen. So that, uh, but even if you don't know what is going to happen four or five years from now, you still need a strategy, and you have to be able to show to the investors that you can navigate uh, a changing field. So... <coughs> Uh, based on, on, the, on this alignment, the science, the project, the team, and the financial projection, that's the way you can raise not only at the beginning a few hundred thousand dollars, followed by the few million, but actually you can raise up to a few hundred million to take the project to fruition. It's very important that along the line there is a way for the investors to get out of their investment because different investors will come at different times for the project. So the project is going to live way longer than the cycle, than the investment cycle of individual investors. And in order to, to put together the project, what you need really is, is someone that will be able to execute the different parts and uh, and be able to, to take it to fruition. Again, if the projects are global, you'll find this exp uh, the expertise uh, worldwide. It's, it doesn't require a lot of effort. It requires especially commitment. Uh, once the people are committed, even if they are not based in the same geographical area, it's actually relatively simple to put together convince them they have to move forward and uh, be committed to the project in order to to take it to fruition so the bottom line is the uh, find the experts it doesn't matter where they are uh, if you're located in silicon valley and the expert happens to be i don't know in berlin well just go to berlin and talk to the expert if the project is good, they'll be on board. You do not have always to be in the same geographical place. The, the small core team should work together, 
but uh, these projects actually involve plenty of different people that don't have to be in one single location. And the most important part is they have to be motivated. You'll motivate different people for different reasons. Uh, people that work in academia that will run, say, a clinical study for you will check that, you're the, that the science is solid and so on. What they want is really a, a, a scientific project with really good science that there will be publications and that you will make uh, a difference in the life of a patient. Well, then if that's what they want, this is what you would, should offer to them. So you should offer the possibility of, of being exposed to really high quality science, to having uh, presentations in scientific meetings and so on. Often investors as well as, uh, they're driven not only by the financial return, but also by the ability of making a difference. Surprisingly, you do find a lot of that in, in venture capital in Silicon Valley. It's not only about how much money they make, they also want to make a, an impact. Well, then uh, that's what you should be able to offer. So, uh, find an, uh, uh, try to make a difference with the disease move the, the project forward in order to uh, find the treatment and uh, you'll be able to find the money even in, in times the, that are more difficult for financing like nowadays. And most important of all, remember, execute, start the project as soon as you can and do it as fast as you can. So I'll, I'll stop here and I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Give it up for our speaker. So we do have time for some questions. Who uh, would like to go first? Here you go. Hi. Uh, I've been told about this uh, venture capital not being really venture. Uh, that it's mostly an European thing. That in the United States, it's, it's really they, they can get more adventurous than in Europe. W what do you think of this? Well, uh, I think it depends a lot it, it, of the specific venture fun, fund. Uh, the, I, I'm not actually, I, I don't think I will agree that they are less risk, well, they are more risk adverse in Europe than in the United States. It, the major difference, I think, is, is that in the United States, they are more uh, they value they're more financially driven so what they value is is whether they're going to make uh, how much money they're gonna make and that means that they'll bet either in very high risk high return projects or uh, much more conservative projects in Europe instead especially in the early stages it's more driven by a strategic considerations as opposed to financial considerations. So often they have mandates by the government to create a sector. That means that they, they'll take more risky projects, especially at the beginning. The problem is, uh, for example, uh, a re, uh, the early stage discovery where the risk is way higher are easier to fund in Europe than they are in the United States. But once you reach the point of, of development, then often it's easier to, be, uh, ra uh, to raise the money in the United States than it is in Europe. For example, cell-based therapy, uh, I think it's easier to find money if you already have a cell-based, uh, a cell line that you can use for a treatment in the United States than it is in Europe. From that point of view, uh, because the financial return can, uh, will be higher, and that's the evaluation they do. Even if it's very high risk, they're willing to take that. But uh, in Europe, they'll be more willing to fund uh, the discovery of that cell line. And that's, imp uh, that's actually riskier, but then they'll stop at the development because it requires way more uh, funds. So, uh, so the, uh, the discovery maybe will be like $3 million. The development maybe will be like 20, 60 million in an area that is way more riskier. So uh, the United States funds are more willing to invest 30 to 60 million in a project that probably no European venture fund will take, but they're not willing to put $3 million in a way higher risk 
project, but Europeans would. So it, it's like it, it's it's an apparent contradiction, but actually it's the way it is. So what you do often is you start the project in Europe, and then you move, you move it to the United States. Thank you. Any other questions? And in the same line, uh, do you find any difference between funding and funding companies in, in the different places of Europe? Uh, yes, there are differences. Uh, uh, the, the actually, the, there are major cultural differences within Europe in terms of funding. But... Uh, uh, at the same time, venture funds in Europe are willing to invest beyond their borders. But the style of, of funding a uh, French company, a VC company, is very different from an English one or a German one or a Swiss one. And uh, the differences are often, well, they, they just reflect the culture. For example, Brit English tend to behave in a way, and, and Swiss, Swiss and English tend to behave in a way much closer to the United States, the venture funds that you find in Silicon Valley or in Boston, than French companies or German companies, uh, venture funds. Uh, the, uh, uh, France is maybe an extreme because in France, uh, well, you know the the government and mandates are actually follow way more than say in England or or in Switzerland. And then uh, it also uh, there are other differences. For example, there's a long tradition in Germany, of uh, as well as in Switzerland, of discovery and development, and that shows in the kind of expertise that venture firms have. They, they are way more knowledgeable of the risks associated to this kind of projects than, say, a uh, venture f fund in, in Italy and Spain where there is just less tradition of innovation. So, uh, it, it, but at the same time, if you go with a good project and your company is based in Germany, frankly, you, you can... Uh, I, I would present the project in Switzerland, in Frankfurt, in London, in, in Paris, in, in, in Barcelona. And uh, because at the end of the day, it really depends on the very specific venture fund and, and each one behaves in a different way. Is that good as an answer for you? Right, do we have any other questions? Feel free. He's here now. All the information you want on entrepreneuring and the biotech industry. But thank you very much. Shakin Trias, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back after lunch. Thanks for coming.